Hello, um, thank you for the invitation, the very kind invitation to speak at this conference today. I've been asked to discuss thrombin generation in haemophilia. So my name's Stephen McDonald. I'm a principal clinical scientist in the specialist hemostasis unit in Ardenbrook's Hospital in Cambridge. Uh, I've worked here for, for some 20 years now, and we've got quite a lot of experience with thrombin generation. We've been using thrombin generation for a number of years, um, both in a research setting and also in a diagnostic setting. So my hope today is to give us a, a rough overview of thrombin generation and how we've used it in our lab, and also some thoughts of where we may be moving forward using it in haemophilia with new treatments coming in. And I'll also discuss a study that we undertook here in Cambridge in collaboration with some teams in Italy and also in Spain regarding the clinical validation of an automated system for thrombin generation. So as, as an introduction, what, what is thrombin generation? And thrombin generation has, has really encompasses the, the evolution of hemostasis processing and hemostasis testing in the laboratory um, over, over the many decades that we've been doing it now. Over 100 years ago, uh, we were first conceptually thinking of hemostasis as being carried out by as few as four coagulation factors, factors one, two, three, and four, first described by Morowitz in 1905, then being fibrinogen, prothrombin, tissue factor, and calcium. And, and as time has progressed in the, in the years that followed, many new discoveries and other factors that were incorporated into hemostasis testing were, were largely placed into the, the physiological process based on patient discoveries of patients who had abnormal clotting time. And as a consequence of that, much of the laboratory testing, which is even now undergone in, in hemostasis laboratories throughout the world, is largely following the cascade system of hemostasis, where we have an intrin intrinsic and an extrinsic pathway causing activation of coagulation, which converges on a on a common pathway, and ultimately ending up with the formation of fibrin from the substrate fibrinogen. And it's the ability of this fibrinogen substrate to clot and form a, an insoluble clot that we use as the basis for, for many of our assays used in, in clinical diagnosis, particularly factor assays used for diagnosis of monogenic disorders such as haemophilia. Now, as the years have gone by, the the physiological understanding of hemostasis has changed dramatically, and we now know it to be a highly integrated network of interacting reactions between a series of serine proteases, which are sequentially activated. But very, very importantly, we also know that it's not a, stri a strictly speaking linear process, that in fact there is a lot, lot of back activation and propagation of the, res of the coagulation process through feedback mechanisms and the central player to that feedback mechanism is thrombin. So although thrombin was very early recognized as being the mediator of cleavage of fibrinogen to fibrin, it also back activates many, many other factors within the coagulation process. Factor 5, factor 8, factor 11, it activates factor 13 after fibrin is formed and we also have a change of substrate specificity of thrombin in that it also helps to activate anticoagulation by activating protein C and has also interactions with the fibrinolytic pathway through TAFI as well. So we now have a more, a more central role for thrombin in the generalized hemostatic response and really the, the multi, multifactorial actions that it has really demonstrates how central it is to the hemostatic response. And because of that, it's become much more interesting within the field to think of the hemostatic response in a global aspect, using thrombin as the mediator of that global, global coagulation potential. And to contrast that to what arguably could also be concerned as global test, the prothrombin time and the APTT, the activated partial thromboplastin time, we were really looking at different parts of the propagation of clot formation. And, and these diagrams on the right will be very familiar to most. For the prothrombin time in the APTT, we 
take a plasma sample, which is um, being usually taken in sodium citrate to collate all the calcium. We add calcium back in along with some activators, as well as a sub uh, lipid substrate surface for the activations to occur. And what we will do is we will measure the time for the clot to form within that plasma over a given time. But very early on, it was, it was demonstrated quite notably that thrombin generation continues far beyond the part that we are considering an endpoint in these routine screening tests, the prothrombin time and APTT. And actually, in reality, that by the time we are considering the endpoint in these tests, only 5% of thrombin generation has actually occurred at that clock time. And it only, uh, only gives us a guide as to the, the effect of the procoagulant factors, which are driving down through the coagulation system and ultimately causing fibrin formation from fibrinogen. We know, and, and we are well experienced, and we understand that the prothrombin time and the APTT are very good at detecting people who have complete absences of procoagulant factors or their cofactors, as is the case in factor eight and haemophilia A. And we know that it's less sensitive, or they're both less sensitive in detecting mild or moderate decreases in coagulation factors um, across the board. So again, the, the PT and APTT are very good for very severe deficiencies, but their sensitivity and specificity um, tail off somewhat as we have more physiological levels that may still be hemostatically abnormal. Importantly, with the prothrombin time in the APTT, we also don't assess anticoagulant presence and the impact the anticoagulant, the anticoagulant pathways have on hemostasis. And, and that's really something that's extremely important, both for thrombophilia um, recurrence, thrombophilia presence, or causes of, or a predisposition to, to be more likely to have a clot, but also in bleeding disorders as well. And we'll come to that later on when we talk about new therapies within, within haemophilia. So thrombin generation was very early identified as a, as a really useful methodology to be able to assess the global hemostatic potential of, of any given patient plasma. And, and the history is, is very is long lived now. And interestingly enough, two very, very prominent groups in the field of hemostasis, historically the group of Dacey and the group of McFarlane and Biggs, in the same issue of the Journal of Clinical Pathology, presented two different methods for trying to assess the thrombin generating capacity of a patient plasma. Um, the, the group of Dacey sh showed it in in patient plasma, whereas the group of McFarlane and Biggs showed it in whole blood. And at that time, the methodology was very laborious, it involved subsampling, um, but it was really quite convincing. And as is early demonstrated, particularly in the, in the McFarlane and Biggs paper, was that it was extremely useful in characterizing patients with haemophilia. And so from there, the more laborious techniques were fine-tuned, and then Dr. Hemker, um, leader in the field with it, establishing this methodology um, using computer-generated software as well as laterally fluorogenic substrates to be able to characterize the, the upsurge or the amplification of thrombin generating capacity within a sample um, across time. And from that, we were able to derive a number of very useful clinically useful parameters which were characterized by the, the characteristic thrombin generation trace that we see now. These parameters include things such as the lag time, so loosely speaking they're very akin to the, the, the period where we would get expect to see clot formation and the prothrombin time in the APTT, but also this period of massive amplification of thrombin generation up into a point where we would see a peak capacity of thrombin generating capacity within the sample and accordingly a time that it takes to get to that peak and also the the endogenous thrombin potential which which is the the overall capacity of the sample to generate thrombin which is characterized by the the parameter ETP and there's other there's other parameters which have come into play as well over time, things such as velocity indexes and measurements to do with the tail, which measures the, the reduction of, of thrombin generating capacity as it's inhibited as the coagulation process continues. And over time, the, 
the literature has shown that since this highly highly useful technology has been available, the, the, the growth in published literature in thrombin generation has grown in, exponentially. And there's on average around about five, six or 700 papers which are using thrombin generation in one way, shape or form that are published annually now. So it's really quite marked that these techniques which were first first established in 1953 and then lottery in the 80s and 90s um, made much more accessible that they're really they're used very very commonly across the across the world but the question is and that always has been and i think to an extent still remains what what where what is the role for thrombin generation where, where does it actually live within the diagnostic repertoire of a hemostasis laboratory and i think it's quite interesting that we we see that it's not purely related to monogenic disorders. I mean, there are a lot of other, even non-hemostatic or traditionally hemostatic issues um, that, that have incorporated and have embraced thrombin generation into their repertoires. Things, there's lots of papers on chronic liver disease, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, all sorts of hemato-oncological aspects, very many diverse fields, many of which are using the acquired um, coagulation abnormalities which are associated with these diseases to try to be characterized by thrombin generation. So these are diseases that don't have an overtly obvious cause for predisposition to having thrombosis or bleeding by the traditional factor assay route, for example. So we're really looking for, is there a way that we can globally characterize hemostasis using thrombin generation in, in other ways? And <clears throat> we've seen even recently, a, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that there has been a lot of publications which are trying to use thrombin generation in the thrombin generation in the well-characterized uh, hypercoagulable state that is associated with COVID-19. Uh, and our group in Cambridge have, have used uh, thrombin generation for publication in COVID-19 as well, um, trying to characterize the, the endothelial activation, hyper hyperthrombotic situation that is characterized so again it's, it's interesting if you think about hemostasis testing we, we don't just do factor assays we don't just do thrombophilia testing we we are very much involved in very diff, very wide varying aspects of of clinical pathology and that there's always going to be a place for something that gives us another way of looking at things than the traditional uh, factor assay and uh, thrombophilia testing usage. And as an example of that, I'll, I'll give you a short case study where um, a few years ago now, we were presented with a patient who was a 31-year-old male, had end-stage renal failure secondary to di diabetic nephropathy. He was very severely unwell and was requiring a simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplant. And I received a phone call from a personal friend who worked in the clinic coordinator's office and said, we have this patient who seems to have quite a strong personal and family history of, of bleeding, particularly post-trauma and post-surgery bleeding, but they, they've come to our centre. We want to do, a, do the operation on them. He desperately needs it, but we don't know whether we're safe to do so or not. And I was asked, do you want to see this patient in your clinic? And of course, that's our bread and butter. That's exactly what I said they should do. So they sent us across the patient and he came and saw us and we took a history and they previously had prothrombin complex concentrates to cover surgery in the past quite successfully. Um, the, his family had also been investigated unsuccessfully to see if they could determine what the problem was. Um, but only interestingly, the, the patient who was presenting to us and his mother described any bleeding. Um, the... The presentation of the bleeding was delayed wound, delayed wound healing, prolonged bleeding. So, so not, not catastrophic spontaneous bleeding or intracranial hemorrhages or joint bleeds or anything like that. It's a more sort of non-specific bleeding diathesis that they had. The only information we were ever given from a laboratory perspective was that they had an abnormal prothrombin consumption index, which very old technique, um, usually used for diagnosis of things like uh, Scott syndrome, but we replicated that in our laboratory when we saw him. And as is the case when we don't have 
an answer from routine normal testing, we would decide to do some thrombin generation on them. And we can quite clearly see on, on the left two thrombin generation traces here that, that he was abnormal. The, the top trace is using five picomolar tissue factor. The bottom trace is using one picomolar tissue factor in the presence of corn trypsin inhibitor to dampen down contact activation. Both graphs show a, dot, a dotted line, which shows the, the range of our reference interval, which is locally determined. And the, the patient presenting to us who was requiring the transplant is shown there in the trace with the filled triangles. And you can see that he's clearly, he's got prolonged lag time, a reduced uh, time to, sorry, a, a reduced peak, a prolonged time to peak, a reduced ETP. So he's got a very, very abnormal thrombin generation in the context of completely normal results for every other aspect of hemostasis that we tested. And this was replicated in five picomolar and one picomolar tissue factor. Interestingly, his mother and his brother, who were demonstrated here with his mother in circles and his brother in squares, also showed reduced thrombin generation, but to less an extent than, than the presenting patient. And interestingly, the brother, looking at panel A, is right at the bottom end of our reference range. And we also find that he had a heterozygous factor five wider, which is very interesting in there. And he was the one that didn't present with any bleeding. So on the right hand two panels, one of my colleagues, Jonathan Langdang, did some investigations whether there was an anticoagulant cause or whether there was an upregulation of the anticoagulant response in this patient. And he first um, added excess protein C to see what happened. And from the filled triangles to the open triangles, you can see by adding protein C into the patient plasma that was enabled, that was able to completely remove all thrombin generation virtually from his plasma. And conversely, by adding an anti-protein C antibody into the patient plasma, we were able to restore thrombin, thrombin generation to the patient. So it was quite clear that there was something going on in the anticoagulant aspect of, uh, of this patient's ability to form a clot. And what we found, if we look at this table here, is that the patient had a massively 400-fold increased elevation of plasma thrombomodulin. So he, the thrombomodulin interacts with the endothelial protein C receptor and is, is associated with the thrombin activity of cleavage of protein C and therefore dampening down of factor eight and factor five activity. So a massive increase in the concentration of thrombomodulin, which was contained within his plasma, not anchored to the endothelial service, as was normally the case. And some further um, investigations into this demonstrated that he had a premature stop codon in the transmembrane region of thrombomodulin, which disrupted the anchoring of the thrombomodulin to this endothelial cells and therefore caused the shedding of thrombomodulin to the plasma and a massive upregulation of his anticoagulant process. And this is a really interesting case study because in the absence of thrombin generation, we never would have known this. And the previous centres, well-established centres who had previously investigated him, had, had got to a point where they couldn't think of another thing to do to test him. So it really shows that, although I mentioned earlier that thrombin generation is, that there's a lot of publications out there with acquired defects, we can also find inherited defects. Um, and also monogenic inherited defects, which are not covered by our current specialist hemostasis repertoire. And secondly, just very quickly last year, our group published uh, another finding, which was based on abnormal thrombin generation findings, where we noticed that there was a number of patients who had what we describe as unclassified bleeding disorders, therefore not characterizable by any of the routine hemostasis tests that we would normally do, that they had a very characteristic and very reproducible picture on their thrombin generation and not being a prolonged lag time and a decreased endogenous thrombin potential. And we investigated further, um, having recalled these patients and found that a large proportion of them had actually got an increased TFPI activity, which could describe what was happening with the thrombin generation, but could also describe what was happening with their 
propensity to have a, throat, a, a clot, uh, sorry, to have a bleed as well. So it's really interesting, again, that in the absence of using thrombin generation as part of a screen for these patients with an indeterminate cause of their bleeding, we, we never would have found this again. And, and there's lots and lots of work in this field. So that's all very positive. I've, I've painted a good picture there of, of a family and, and of another group of patients who we've been able to characterize phenotypically using thrombin generation. So the immediate question is, is thrombin generation ready for routine use? And the fact that we're asking that question means that there obviously must be a reason why perhaps we're not, or at least there may be questions raised as to why they're not. And the thing that's always raised with thrombin generation is lack of standardization between centers. And then this has well been mentioned across all the literature which has ever mentioned in thrombin generation. Tissue factor concentration, the absence or presence of contact activation, whether we dampen it down with corn trips inhibitor or factor 12 inhibitors, the concentration of lipids the, and the constitution of those lipids, the PCPSPE ratios, what sample type should be used, how they should be handled, how they should be pre-processed, including temperature control, incubation times, and whether the parameters that we are reporting for thrombin generation should be normalized against some sort of standard. If we're looking in certain clinical situations and we're looking for thrombophilia or a propensity to form a clot, hypercoagulability, we need to be considering, or do we, do we need to add an activated protein C, thrombomodulin, at what concentration? How does that affect the sensitivity and specificity? And how do we how do we assure our quality assurance in these in these uh, techniques? How do we quality control them? How do we use them for EQA, etc.? And in part to answer that question, um, Stago have released a, a new analyzer, which is an automated platform for thrombin generation. Um, using similar technology as, as we've used when we do it manually using thrombinoscope, um, using the Zyglycli RGMC fluorophore, which is then cleaved, um, and it's, it's emitted and measured at different wavelengths to give a very similar thrombin generation profile that we're familiar with. But the purpose of this analyzer is to try and answer a lot of these standardization issues which have been um, which have been placed on thrombin generation over the years. So standardization of reagent composition, standardization of temperature and control and, and things like that. And why is that important? Well, that's extremely important in haemophilia now because we are now seeing a massive change a massive paradigm shift in the way that haemophilia A and B is treated. And certainly in, in the 20 years that I've worked within the, within the field, the, the changes that have come in haemophilia treatment are, that makes it unrecognizable to what it was before. Back in the 50s and 60s, cryoprecipitate was used as a replacement therapy and then that advanced to plasma derived products, recombinant products. And now we're seeing things like extended half-life products using pegylation or FC receptor binding. And even more recently, we're seeing things such as gene therapy by specific antibodies, completely changing the way that we are, loosely speaking, replacing factor eight activity within patients with haemophilia. And that has a knock-on effect of how we actually handle that within the laboratory, because we are very used to measuring haemophilia or diagnosing haemophilia using coagulation factor assays, be that the one stage or the chromogenic factor assay, both for uh, both for factor eight and factor nine. Uh, and we're used to also measuring patients who may have developed inhibitors as a consequence of treatment using Bethesda assays. But now that we're using different treatments, we're really wondering now, how, how do we, how are the assays traceable to what we're actually replacing the patient with. And, and in some cases, we're, we're not measuring the same thing at all. So then the question is, again, has the door become open for thrombin generation to really show its, its clinical utility in this field? And the reason that haemophilia is a really useful paradigm for this is because it really exemplifies a lot of the, the outcomes of, of what we are trying to achieve in a clinical laboratory. And if we loosely think of things as we're trying to diagnose patients or trying to monitor patients who we pre previously diagnosed over time, we need to know that <clears throat> the assays that we are using are useful for these purposes. And how do we determine if that's true or not? 
Well, there's a hierarchy that's been provided by the IFCC in 2015 following a meeting in Milan, which say that we should be determining how good our assays are based on clinical outcome studies, ideally, as the pinnacle of evidence-based medicine that we have for that, and failing that biological variation or worst case scenario expert opinion. And haemophilia is actually one of the very few situations in hemostasis where we do have reasonable data about clinical outcome studies, but they are in the context of factor assays and reporting of how of what factor assays were used, what EPTT reagents, what analyzer platform, etc., can sometimes be the, the data can sometimes be missing. So it makes it very difficult to us. So what we need is a standardized platform where we know that everything is playing off the same level playing field so that we can diagnose patients and monitor patients in a harmonized way. So in order to try and achieve that, we, again, as I mentioned before, in conjunction with a group in Italy and a group in Spain, performed a clinical validation of the Genesia platform. So that's the automated platform provided by Stego with the primary objective of, in the first instance, showing that the standardized thrombin generation assay on this platform um, can detect decreased thrombin generation in patients hemophili with haemophilia A and B. Additionally, we wanted to evaluate the precision, the performance, the performance metrics of the, of the assay um, in these patients, and important things such as storage conditions of plasmas, how well, how stable plasmas were over a period of time, whether there was a clinically significant change in those results over time, because that really benefits the user at the bottom end of being able to store plasmas and test them at a later date should they wish to. And we also wanted to check to see whether there was any um, correlation with mild and moderate and severe haemophilia A and B with thrombin generation. So the form that the study took was an initial familiarization phase, which was, which is extremely important and is often forgotten about in clinical validations because the success of these clinical studies is always with the user at the, at the front end using these machines. So the validation of the machines and the reagents and the calibration, et cetera, the ease of use is very important to do. The second phase was taken as being the stability and the third phase was the testing of the samples across the three sites the numbers of which are shown in this table here. So we, you can see that we categorize patients as severe haemophilia A or B, and also mild or moderate haemophilia A, and with an additional category of mild or moderate haemophilia A with factor eight discrepancies. So that's um, something that we do encounter quite commonly in the laboratory. They were also categorized into severe bleeders and non-severe bleeders, and that was done by the clinical teams at each of the sites. And those were the patients that we recruited to the study over the period of the validation. For stability of the, of the results, we showed, as has been demonstrated previously, that there's a high variability um, of how what results we get over a period of time. Reassuringly, there was no trend observed in, in samples trending um, either high or low over time. So freezing of the samples over a period of time demonstrated that they were stable over that period of time. But the control plasmas, which were taken from normal volunteers, consented and recruited at, the, at each individual site, those, those showed a high degree of variability, which, which really shows what's been previously shown in the literature, that there is a high baseline variability between people. And that goes back to the original triad of performance metrics that I showed previously, that the biological variation of, of thrombin generation in, patient, in people um, is, is very wide. So the inter and the intra biological variation is quite wide and, and results need to be need to be assessed in that context. But reassuringly, the, the final conclusions were that samples are stable at a minimum of minus 70 degrees C's for six months, with the proviso that standardized collection, processing, and thawing, pro thaw sorry, thawing protocols are followed. So moving on to the comparisons of haemophilia A against healthy, we can see here yeah, using the box plots that using normalized parameters, which were used for the analysis throughout the study because it was found that normalizing them against the 
the standard plasma used as part of the assay reduced the imprecision within the assay significantly and led to much more acceptable CVs. So the normalized log time did uh, showed a showed a significant difference, but you can see that there's quite a wide range here, and there's the presence of a number of outliers. Um, the peak height was statistically significantly different, and the normalized ETP likewise. So, so that was that was reassuring, and that was the Cambridge and Pacenza data um, aggregated at the time. And equally for hemophilia B, the same things were seen. There was, with the exception that there was no statistically significant difference between the normalized log time, but we reproduced the, the height and the ETP were two parameters that were statistically significantly different, as you would entirely expect in patients who were diagnosed as having hemophilia A and hemophilia B. So having, having used, having completed that study, we're, we're now confident and we've now shown from a, from a clinical validation that the Genesia assay does provide a standardized platform that we can use for diagnosis and potentially for monitoring patients with haemophilia. But where are we now? Where, where, do, we, where do we move on for using th thrombin generation in general in haemophilia? And I think the increases in standardization are, are they're clear for everybody to see and they are constantly improving. We are still finding new things that need to be improved with the thrombin generation assay and there's some very valuable research which has come out recently with things such as the temperature incubation and the period of incubation time that is required in the thrombin generation assay and also the storage of the samples, whether samples should, should have the, the head um, reduced so the space above the plasma to the top of the vial when it's been frozen should be reduced um, and that has a significant impact on thrombin generation that's been published recently so so we're still we're still constantly learning we're still trying to improve the standardization of the assay and it's quite clear from externally external quality assurance program returns that there, there is still a high degree of variability in the thrombin generation assay across all techniques, but the CVs across all of the different methodologies are improving. But what really, I think, where we're really going to be using thrombin generation a lot more for is, is when we have different method, uh, different treatments for haemophilia A and B moving in, in the future. The things such as how do we characterize a reduction in efficacy of a replacement therapy if um, if a patient has developed an inhibitor, for example. So we, we do see that there's a dose-dependent inhibition of thrombin generation in the presence of an inhibitor in a patient with haemophilia A, but the correlation isn't great, and certainly using things, using the traditional factor assays and the inhibitor Bethesda assays, the correlation isn't great with the strength of the inhibitor and the degree to which the patient is at risk of bleeding. Um, and that's been demonstrated throughout the literature. And using thrombin generation to measure the reduction of efficacy of replacement therapies has, has been used as far back as 2005. And I think that's really going to be somewhere where we have to use it a little bit more, more proactively. We, we, in Cambridge, we have for a long time measured replacement therapy in patients with factor VIII inhibitors when they were treated with things such as Novo7 and FIBA. We know that we can't really apply the extent to which the thrombin generation corrects or, or the rotational thromboelastometry corrects across the entire population, but we can do it on an individual patient by patient basis. And we can have a reasonably good handle of how different dosages affect the hemostasis in, in these patients. So I think thrombin generation is certainly going to become more and more relevant for things like this, particularly in the context of replacement therapy and maybe unusual replacement therapies for patients who are having breakthrough bleeds on, on new treatments. So um, fiturazan and emicizumab and things like that, if, if there's any treatment with other treatments which we're not necessarily used to seeing in haemophilia patients all the time, such as prothrombin complex concentrates, then we need to have a way of assuring ourselves that it's having a having a hemostatic effect in the patient. And I think thrombin generation realistically could potentially be the only way that we can do this reproducibly. And again, this is something that is that is speckled throughout the literature. There, 
<clears throat> excuse me, there's papers from 2003, 2009, which have demonstrated the utility of thrombin generation in patients with inhibitors who achieve the coronal complex concentrates. The other thing is also different types of thrombin generation assays. And I've talked about haemophilia A and haemophilia B today, but the other haemophilia, if you like, haemophilia C, factor 11 deficiency, has been shown that in order to perform thrombin generations in patients who have a reduced factor 11, factor 11 assays by one stage clotting method are very poorly, poorly correlated to risk of bleeding. And we know that. Um, however, thrombin generation in PRP samples, which I haven't discussed today, in addition to having the contrypsin inhibitor in there, shows a better correlation to risk of bleeding than actually one stage factor eight coagulation assays do. So I suppose the take home message from that is that, of course, I mean, thrombin generation, we're used to doing it in plasma based system, but thrombin also activates platelets, the thrombin uh, receptors, the PAR receptors on platelets, PAR1, PAR4, and we know that thrombin has a central role in activation of that. So adjusting our techniques to incorporate platelets and using PRP-based thrombin generation is a field where there's a lot of research going on just now, and I think that's going to be extremely useful for us. I think the future is bright for thrombin generation. I think we've got more and more data now that is helping us standardize the technique. It's helping us to understand the technique a little bit better. And I think it's now becoming more of a, of a go-to methodology for people to prospectively assess its effect, effectiveness in new therapies which are coming, coming onto the market. So the, there's a paper by De La Kremers from this year, which has suggested the use of thrombin generation for tailoring personalized medicine, tailoring antithrombin targeting therapy in patients with hemophilia, equally with antithrombin reduction or antithrombin activity reduction using included with bypassing agents, Livinat, it's all published in 2020, the use of thrombin generation there. But we're not limited to only using thrombin generation in in treatment aspects of haemophilia as well, it can give us very useful information to pathophysiology of diseases which we otherwise haven't identified, such as the thrombomodulin defect I mentioned earlier, or the TFPI defects that I mentioned, or things like FACT5 short, FACT5 Atlanta, things like that, which have all used thrombin generation now to demonstrate the effect of these unusual or very rarely seen coagulation disorders and thrombin generation has been central to understanding the pathophysiology of that. Um, Shell in 2019 published a paper about TFPI being a key determinant along with factor 8 clearly in haemophilia and haemophilia B thrombin generation and also using things in different aspects that maybe perhaps we're not so familiar with. So pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic modeling of replacement therapies in haemophilia. Very topical, very new, very widespread now that people are undertaking this. And Kreben in this year, in 2021, has published a paper about how using the Hill equation modeling of replacement therapy using pharmacokinetic modeling and thrombin generation parameters can be useful. Other things such as antiplatelet therapy and high clinical risk. So a subset of patients who are having platelet inhibitory therapy who are also showing it's been a higher clinical risk. And there has been evidence to show that thrombin generation can identify patients. And this again was published this year by Debrit et al. Um, and, and I mentioned before about measuring breakthrough bleeds, replacement therapy on breakthrough bleeds in patients in with haemophilia who are using a new or, or new therapies, including things such as emicizumab. Um, and there's also a factor eight equivalency of emicizumab by thrombin generation metric, which has been suggested by Kizilak again this year in 2021. So I think it's quite clear that, that really the, the use of thrombin generation in haemophilia and beyond is a very fertile, fertile field for us in hemostasis. And I think it's only ever going to get going to get bigger. And in order to achieve that, what do we need? We need better clinical outcome data. And I think that's a criticism that we can have for a lot of hemostasis assays, not just thrombin generation, but particularly with these new therapies being used and 
standardized therapies being used in different clinical situations. We really need to know how thrombin generation performs um, with these patients where clinical outcomes are recorded. As an extension to that, in the absence of clinical outcome data, we need to have a better understanding of biological variation, where that, where that lies with patients, both within, within patients and between patients. And even the lower rung of that, of that triad, the state of the art and expert opinion, thrombin generation is still isolated in very specialist centres. Not many places use it, and the extent to which it uses is not standardised. So I think we, we need to improve on that as well. But we have shown that it can be used to detect monogenic disorders, especially monogenic disorders which have been identified that haven't been picked up by our traditional clot-based chromogenic or immunological-based assays. Soluble thrombomodulin, FAT5 short, FAT5 Atlanta, I've mentioned them already, all usefully determined or usefully identified using thrombin generation. And in doing so, it can help us improve further the, the mechanisms at play, the pathophysiology, the physiological and biochemical processes that are associated with hemostasis, and also application using thrombin generation for detecting outcomes for, for drug development. And it's very commonly used to, to measure hemostasis activation for treatments which may not in any way be associated with hemostasis. So it's good that it's actually been used further afield. That brings me to the to the end. I again thank the organisers for inviting me to speak today. Um, a quick acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge obviously all the, the, the members of the team past and present from the specialist hemostasis unit, so that's the clinical team and the laboratory team. Um, in particular, Jane Mullins, who did a lot of the work with the Genesia clinical validation that we did. Divya Patak and in fact the entire Genesia team from Stego who support Stego who supported the the whole study. And finally, of course, thank you all for listening.